Welcome to your Truth Revealed video podcast, sharing the power of self-knowledge. I'm Erica Marcu. Episode two, Know Your Contribution, is the second part of an interview with Dr. Art Markman. This interview helps you make a contribution and change your behavior to successfully accomplish it. All of season one helps you to be your own health expert as I interview industry professionals to explore your hidden mental and physical health potential. I'm with Dr. Art Markman, who is a professor of psychology and marketing at the University of Texas at Austin. He is the co-host of the radio show and podcast, Two Guys on Your Head, produced by KUT. He is on the advisory boards for the Dr. Phil Show and the Dr. Oz Show. He is the author of Smart Thinking, Habits of Leadership, and Smart Change, which is the focus of this podcast today. If we think about deadlines, one of the things that deadlines do is that they create the energy that we need to get something done. Thank you for joining us. Oh, Eric, it's great to be here. <laughs> it's good to have you here. The primary reason I want to have this interview is to help people make a contribution and change their behavior in order to accomplish it. Goals allow yourself the flexibility to change them. We often set unrealistic expectations for the achievement that we make on the road toward making a contribution. Yeah. How do we even know when we're sitting back and making our New Year's resolutions or contributions if they are even realistic? Well, we may or may not know. Sometimes you just have to try. I mean, sometimes you, you really do need to think, what can I realistically achieve? So when I decided, okay, I'm going to learn to play the saxophone. Well, that's a realistic thing to do. But I didn't say, I'm going to learn to play the saxophone this year, meaning in a year, I'm going to be a great sax player. That would I mean, have been unrealistic for you at that time. Give, yeah, at that time with my life as it was, giving myself a 10-year time horizon seemed about right. But there are times where you can adjust things a little bit and say, okay, this is something that I think is realistic. And then sometimes you got to try it and then say, part of what I'm doing is I'm exploring the space of possibility. I like that. And I'm going to learn this is what I can do, and this falls beyond what I'm capable of doing right now, given the situation that I'm in. And do I want to make a decision, perhaps, to change my situation, which mm -hmm. is something that people sometimes do as well. They think, you know what, this goal is so important to me that I'm going to make a change. I've had many friends over the years, for example, who've changed careers mm -hmm. because they woke up and thought, you know what, I really want to make this contribution in my life. And sometimes that contribution really is contribution in the form of giving back to society, mm -hmm. you know, giving back to others. And we'll say the only way that I can do that is to actually make a significant career shift, mm -hmm. you know, that I'm going to leave this job, potentially leave the safety and security of this and do something else entirely. And it's a bold move to make. There's a risk in that. That's right. But it, but sometimes you have to recognize this thing that I'd like to accomplish is so significant that I simply can't do it given the structure of the situation. Mm -hmm. You know, one thing that I love to look at is language. Mm -hmm. And one of the cool things that you talked about is how the way that we communicate to one another, like buying a shirt, where we usually would say, I bought a shirt, rather than I went shopping for a shirt. Right which is more process oriented. And you right. show how there are two types of goals. So you think about your behavior change as a process right. rather than that outcome. Yeah. And even the way that we communicate about the contribution then is through a process way of communicating it. That's right. I mean, so if you only focus on outcomes, it's very hard. I mean, not only for the reasons that we talked about, mm -hmm. that the outcome, that, that achieving that outcome isn't necessarily gonna make you that happy for very long, but also, if you think about motivation, uh, you're very motivated at the beginning, right? People who write a book. I wrote uh, <laughs> uh, the, the beginning of the first chapter, woohoo, you know? And towards the end, if you get there, you're like, I'm almost done. If I could just get through this chapter, I'm done. But then there's that chewy middle, right? Chapters two through, you know, nine, that you're past the, the excitement of the beginning. You can't see the end yet. And when you're in that period, 
just thinking about the outcome doesn't help you very much. That's where that process becomes so important. And so really thinking about the fact that what I'm doing is writing. Exactly. It's an ING right. action it's a, verb. That's it's right. A it's, a, it's a process. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I have a lot of friends who say to me, I'd love to write a book. And what they really mean is I'd love to have written a book. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to be beyond the work of right. it on the other side. Exactly. Unfortunately, the writing of it is, is generally speaking, actually a big part of the process of and you use go. Stephen King as an example exactly. he gets up every day and he writes that's, that's just right. his habit yeah. I don't think that he's thinking I want to write a book yeah he's thinking I'm I'm enjoying probably writing this yeah. book and it's my habit and it's know? my habit it's yeah. what I do right there are many fascinating things that I learned in this book one of them is that our brain is designed to spend as little time thinking as possible. I didn't actually realize that, but yeah. it makes sense yeah. because it's expensive to run. Yeah. Energy hungry organ. 3% <laughs> of your body weight uses 20 to 25% of your daily energy supply. And wow. Basically, it's just using that amount of energy physiologically to keep moving. The more time that you spend doing anything, the more energy you're spending on it. And so your brain is trying to be economical, but it's being economical in time because that's the way it minimizes energy. Best way to be economical from a brain standpoint is to use a habit that is to mm -hmm. remember what you're supposed to do rather than to have it to think about what to do. And that's one of the reasons why habits are such a critical part of long-term behavior change. You said it uses 20 to 25 percent of the calories you burn each right. day just to just keep to your run brain, the brain going. Yeah. And I love this part. The brain requires about the same amount of energy no matter what it is doing. When you are thinking hard, whatever that means, your brain is using about the same amount of energy it uses when you're engaged in well-practiced routines. What's expensive about running a brain is just all of the energy that's required to create electrical signals in the first wow. place. Doing a little bit more, a little bit less doesn't, I mean, it's just, there's small changes, but, but not, it's not really that strongly measurable compared mm -hmm. to just what it costs to keep the lights on. Oh, that's so fascinating. Yeah, your brain wants to minimize the amount of time you spend thinking about anything to make sure the energy cost of thinking does not exceed the value of what you are thinking about. Right. And that's why, again, when we're back to your March 4th, right. that there's so much brain energy that you'd be using when you make that declaration of what you want your goal to be and then the planning for it. Yeah. And then hopefully by March 4th, you're just implementing it and it becomes a habit. Right. Okay. Exactly. How is your relationship to deadlines like a three-act play? I mean, you're actually talking about the Yerkes Dodson curve here, if you want. I, I mean, want to talk about all of it. Okay. <laughs> so, all right. If we think about deadlines, one of the things that deadlines do is that they create the energy that we need to get something done. And, and so the thing about all of the goals that you have is that at any given moment, there's lots of potential things that could be drawing on your time. Mm -hmm. And so you have to decide at any given moment, what am I going to work on? And there are lots of ways we make that decision. Habits are one of them. Habits are ways of your memory saying, no, no, this is what you should do right now. But another way that we influence our behavior is by creating a deadline. So let's suppose, let's suppose that you were going to prepare for a podcast. Oh, right. And let's imagine that that podcast is not going to be taped for three weeks. Mm -hmm. How much effort are you going to put into that? Because I read the book, I know there's two different types of yeah, people, aren't there? That's right. And the first one. There's high arousal and low arousal people. I'm a high arousal so that means I will plan and plan. I'll do so much prep work before yeah. this interview. That's what I did. Yeah. Knowing full well that I would reach the panic phase yeah. closer and closer to the deadline, which right. is in fact what happened. Uh -huh. So it's very predictable. Yeah. And with that predictability, that helps me manage my time. Yeah. And so that's our three act play is that way out from the deadline, there's going to be some period of time, no matter how high arousal you are, there's going to be some period of time where this is still not as high a priority as other things you have to do. And then there's a sweet spot. There's that a level of, of energy or arousal that is perfect for you to get a lot done. And then there's this level of arousal where you're just so, you've got so much energy, you 
you're panicked. You, you, you can't concentrate. You've got too much going on. The closer and closer the deadline comes, you know, at some point it's far enough away. You really don't want to work on it because you've got other things you need mm -hmm. to do. And too close to the deadline and you're, and you're in that panic mode, somewhere in the middle, you're in the sweet spot. Now, it would be great if everyone were the same, if you could just tell everybody, okay, just wait until you're a week out from this and then start working on it. But the problem that would drive me crazy. Right. And that and but the problem is some people are naturally really high arousal people, which means that even three weeks out from the deadline, they've got enough energy to make progress. But the problem is, you know, there's, it, you can think of this as if it's an inverted U. So take the letter U, turn it upside down. The two bottom parts, each of those is performance, right? You've got your level of performance and there's a low level of performance when you've got low levels of arousal. Then as you go up, 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 up uh, on the arousal curve, and this is this is actually discovered by two guys named Yerkes and Dodson way back in 1905. Nice. At some point you reach that peak level at which you're operating at your peak, after which you go over the edge of that curve and now additional arousal makes you perform worse again. And that's right. that panic mode. <laughs> And the problem is if you're a very high arousal person, you, you can be really far away from the deadline and still be at that peak. And now even a week out from the deadline, you just can't work anymore. And so for people like that, you've actually got to start way in advance. Whereas there are other people we know who are low arousal people. I, I like to say that they need to have a small thermonuclear device detonated underneath their chair before right. they can get anything so done. So that, that's my daughter. Yeah. She and I are opposite which makes life a little more challenging. That's right. And and it's particularly challenging if you're parenting, if you're a high arousal parent, parenting a low arousal child, where you're like, how could you not have started this yet? And they're like, whatever, that's until right. the very last minute at which they get it done. And that's where you just have to take a step back and say, you know what, just as long as you get it done, you know, get it done. But if you think you're going to need my help, please bear in mind that three hours before the deadline, I'm going to be a quivering bowl of jello. So if you're going to need my help, you're going to also going to have to hit me up much earlier in the process. Perfect example, Thanksgiving dinner. Mm -hmm. Alex loves to cook. I don't particularly like it, but I'll do it. You know, I'll do it needs to be done. I will start two days ahead of time. I'll even set the table. I'll have all of this done and I'm excited. I'm in that sweet spot and it's way in advance. And she's looking at me like I'm crazy. Yeah. And to look at it more, I guess, as a, as a team effort, I'll do more of the effort up front yeah. and get a lot accomplished. And then she will be that person at the last minute who's making sure that everything is perfect right before someone walks through the front door. Yeah where I am meditating in my room with the door shut for about an hour before everybody comes over. <laughs> All I can manage to do is just breathe. Yeah. I just think the knowledge, the self-awareness right. that that is how people are naturally yeah. and working with our strengths and That's using right. that to, to meet our goals is the best way to go about it. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And have compassion and for me and for her. I think it's it's important to, to recognize the differences between people. And I think a lot of people are unaware of this curve. Right. And so they don't realize why it is that they're reacting so much differently than everybody else is to a particular situation. Yeah. Because I wouldn't know if I was the crazy one or if yeah. it was her. But right. turns out neither. Neither. We're just different. We're just different and that's yeah. okay. How often do you reevaluate your contribution? There is a sweet spot there. You don't want to be reevaluating yourself every week. That's not enough time to know whether you're making progress or not. I usually say you want to be a little careful about how much navel gazing you do in your life. <laughs> Once or twice a year is probably really? good. Yeah, okay. I think too much because it takes a while to know whether you're succeeding or not. And so, you know, you, you often need several months of concerted effort before you know, yes, I'm making some progress or wow, this really isn't working. Any more than three times a year and you're really trying, you're doing this, you're micromanaging yourself. Oh, wow. And so well, I've been micromanaging myself. Good so, to know. Yeah. So I think, I think what you want to do is, you know, you want to pay attention to how do I think this is going, but in terms of really reevaluating, like, is this worth doing? 
Don't don't do that so often, right? Partly because the more times that you ask yourself, is this really worth doing, the more opportunities you're giving yourself to say no. So, so, you know, if I'm, if I'm on the road, let me give myself six months to really try this and then see how I'm doing. Now, that's not to say that if I notice that, that I'm systematically missing something, if I'm trying to, to learn a new skill and I'm really only practicing once a week, after a month of only practicing once a week, I got to realize if I don't find a couple of more practice times, I'm not really going to learn how to do this. So now let me think a little bit about next week. Where can I put this onto my schedule? You know, three times, you know, don't say seven times right away. Let me see if I can mm -hmm. just get on my calendar three times and improve from there. So be realistic, but so you can make little mid course corrections. But in terms of really reevaluating, is this where I should be? Is this what I should be doing? That's, that's really on the once to twice a year basis. That's so good to know. And when you're changing habits, this can affect your family, your friends. Do you have any suggestions about setting yourself up for success where they're concerned? There's several things you have to do. First of all, I think it can be useful to bring other people into the process with you to encourage you, mm -hmm. particularly if you're doing something where a little bit of outside energy might be valuable, where okay. somebody could say, yeah, that's great. I'm glad you're I'm glad you're making progress on that. Then I then I think actually having other people's help can be useful. And, and so bringing them in can be a good thing. However, it's also the case that there are things that you could do that have a, an impact on other people's lives. You know, if you're going to exercise more often, for example, that let's say that you decide to take up yoga. Let's say you're, you're a working professional, so you still have to go through your work day, but now you'd like several days a week to go to yoga right after work. Wonderful, except now you're not getting home till seven o'clock in the evening. Mm -hmm. How's that going over with everybody? So what are you doing to make sure that you can still have family meal times or, or that you can still help with homework or whatever responsibilities you have? Because the action you're taking is affecting other people, it's not that you should then give up on it. But first of all, enlist their help. If I only got home at seven o'clock, how could we still achieve our family goals together? Recognize, I know this is going to be a hardship. I'm asking for something that is affecting you. You are doing something selfish, but that doesn't mean you have to do it selfishly. Oh, I like right? that. Because there's nothing wrong with taking care of yourself. Especially you know, as of, parents, it's right. a good thing to remind us of. And honestly, there's a gender difference, right? Yes, Women, there is. If you say to a man you're being selfish, they might take offense, but they still do it all else being equal. I don't want to overgeneralize, but many women, you say you're being selfish and they stop doing it. It's okay to take care of yourself. And actually serving as an example for your child, you have to take care of yourself first before you can really take care of anybody else. That's right. You can't be effective in helping anyone else if you're not in a good place. That's right. I so appreciate your time. And I love your book you. and you have several more out there and there's lots of ways to get to, to find you. What, what's the best way for people to find you? I'm pretty active on social media. I'm on Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter and even on Instagram. I write pretty regularly for Psychology Today, for mm -hmm. Fast Company, for Harvard Business Review. You mentioned the radio show and podcast, Two yeah. Guys on Your Head. Yeah. So if you follow me on social media, I try to put up links to all this stuff as well as other things that I've bumped into that I think are interesting. Nice. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. It's all good right. to see you. You too. Yeah. <laughs> Our feature product for this episode is Designs for Health 14-Day Detox. With comprehensive nutritional support, you'll cleanse your liver, kidneys, gallbladder, and GI tract to create a new habit. This detoxification program is gentle and simple to use. Go to your truthreveal.com slash store and use promo code TRUTH for a 20% discount. What are the signs or specific markers for your success? I invite you to post your answer in the comments below. There are also great resources in the description. Episode three is titled, Know Your Neurotransmitters with Pam Malcolm Hemley. Please subscribe and click on the bell so you'll know when the next episode is available. 
For more learning, download your free worksheet at yourtruthreveal.com. Thank you for watching. I'm Erica Marcoux.